And we are here with Ed Fries of many, many ventures in life. Um, most <laughs> famously, of course, Xbox. Uh, and, you know, we were discussing, obviously, the Halo cartridge. You've got the good one there, too. Well, what I do. See? I think you do, right? You, the, the, the Halos. The, <laughs> That's a nice mic you got there, Scott. Yeah, right. you got the original one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. The this, CGE version. Yeah. That's absolutely. what I meant by the good one. Um, yeah, those are selling over 400 bucks now on eBay. It's crazy. I know, and that's mine. <laughs> we have a, I got a suitcase down there stuffed full of CGE launch goodies. I mean, oh. that's what my favorite thing to do at CGE is uh, pick up the new releases, you know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, the 2600, because remember... Uh, are we doing the show now? <laughs> well, well, we're just we're chatting. pretty freeform, but we'll, okay. we'll let you know what officially but starts. We're no, so but. professional, we can bullshit. I mean, you're recording it. Or oh, something. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Recording. Okay, that's yeah. fine. It's <laughs> just a long sound check. I'll just remember not to swear. No. Oh, no. No, oh, no, you no, no swear. On this swear. goddamn show? <laughs> Fuck, you can say anything you want. That's right. No, really, we are very freeform. But no, it was, uh, you know, I remember they had, you know, the not really 2600 sorry. poster up and, yeah. you know, the whole presentation. And I just, what sold me, other than the fact I already knew I sold, was when I saw that ring. Yeah, that the the, the, the ring the and, home and screen, the home page there. The ring, the ring turned out really God, well. That was I was awesome. I was working wow. on that, and um, and I thought, oh yeah, because I only have two sprites there, and I thought, well, if I take the two sprites and I kind of bring them down together at the bottom, it'll sort of look like a ring, and and I wrote the code for it, and it came up, and it was like much better. It looked better than I expected, yeah. you know. Yeah. And sometimes that happens. So that's an example of programming, you know, like that. I did that part, great, no problem. The stars behind it, a huge pain in the ass. <laughs> the stars, I, I, I tried, it was months. I mean, not continuously, but I did one version of the stars and I, I sent it out. Uh, one of my playtesters is a guy named Ian Bogost. Have you ever heard of him? He did the like cow clicker, which was this Facebook uh, uh, no. spoof I, on no, all I remember Facebook. Cow Clicker, yeah. Oh no! I, here's how you might know Ian Bogas. He wrote the game. Uh, he wrote the book Racing the Bean. Oh, okay. yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So he's one of the two authors of that book. Yeah. Anyway, he was one of my playtesters, and he just kept sending me mail. The stars suck. And so I just, <laughs> I just kept ha redoing the stars, and I could not get the stars right. But anyway, finally, I, I found a way to do the stars. But the ring was like instant. the stars sound like be the, the the easy part. You know, there's this crazy thing you can do on the 2600 where you can um, screw up the graphics chip and it'll make stars. Uh, it, ma it makes a really cool looking star effect and they used it in a bunch of games. But there's, um, it works fine as long as you don't move a, a, a sprite. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you confuse it and you, it, it puts all this, this star-like pattern. But I needed to move the sprites to bring them together to make that ring. Mm -hmm. And so I had to not use that method. And right, so instead, okay. anyway, yeah. it's one of those things where it's not like it's that hard, but you're trying to do it in 10 bytes or right. something. You know, you're yeah. trying to find some really tight way to do it. And then it gets hard. So. Well, that was the neat thing, though, is, is it did come off working so well. And it was so, you know, much like the Master Chief, it was so faithful to the Halo, you know, what they, you, what the kids that grew up on Halo grew up seeing, you know. Yeah. And it was uh, one of those deals where I would just, like I said, put it in, let it sit there on the save screen, you know, the, the, the load screen. People come by, Halo, cool. And they plopped on the couch. It was so funny is watching how many of them didn't know how to start the game. <laughs> they pick up the controller. I, 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 and, uh, <laughs> I know, like the biggest mistake I made in the game was was putting the gun up, you know, a, a room above you. And I did it because, in, as you know, in, in Halo, you didn't start it with, with no gun. Yeah, you leave so the I, so uh, chamber or whatever, and yeah. Yeah, you have no gun. So I thought, oh, that'll be, because I tried to put sort of Halo in jokes through, throughout yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And so I did that, but you know, it's endless people <laughs> constantly. How do I shoot? I don't know how to shoot, yeah, you know? Yeah. And it's, you know, it's true. I start you on a screen, you have three choices, and two of them don't lead you to the gun, so. Yeah. You know, every, everybody's new when they start. <laughs> you know, two out of three of them get confused. Right. So I'd have to you know, explain. It's bad game design. I blame the designer. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd have to, a couple times. I have to go. I, maybe there's a gun you have to look for. You know, like, like remember in <laughs> the Halo for the Xbox that came later yeah. after this one. You would have to find a gun. The first one probably did the same thing. <laughs> oh yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> but they would. You're playing with them. I would, yeah. uh, of course. And these kids would sit there and play it and play it and play, it, and it was occupied. In fact, so much. I'll tell you how busy it was that uh, 
for our booth next year, we have a, in the arcade. We have a booth that there because we're part of the arcade section, you know. Yeah. And um, our booth at Magfest is about twice the size of this, and we have all the stuff set up. You know, I'm gonna bring a uh, tabletop cabinet with a 2600 in it and a standard arcade controller, just playing twi Halo 2600 because yeah. it is such a draw at Magfest that we're gonna use it just to bring traffic into our booth. Awesome. <laughs> Speaking of people that couldn't play, you know, find the gun. If you've ever watched a young kid like sit up and boot up a, uh, an Atari, we were at E3 a couple years ago and we had the the old television, the, the couch, the whole thing, you know, yeah. at, uh, there at the, you know, Joe, Sean, and John's museum booth. And the kids that sit down with this Atari 2600, they'd pop in Space Invaders, and they couldn't, for the life of them, figure out how to start the game. You oh, know, yeah, with the well, that is you know, hard they kept hitting the button and stuff. God, it was funnier than yeah. that. Um, reset, you know, yeah. what? what yeah. And no idea. You may have been at E3 a few times more than us. I've but, been to uh, a few times. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, the thing is, it's, it's okay, it's, it's just a game. It's an Atari game, which, you know, we buy all the new releases. The new releases are just so cool. Right. I think it was, uh, it was somebody that was doing a discussion uh, on the technical aspects of the Atari. He basically gave a verbal presentation with slides of Racing the Beam, yeah. which is through that I truly understood finally how 2600 programming works. Yeah, yeah, which um, is a pain in the butt. Yeah, yeah. it is. Well, <laughs> it's interesting. It is, you know, yeah. And not being a, a coder or developer, I can go, oh, that's interesting without going, I have a stake and it's going to make my life miserable. I can just go, it's interesting and pass, you know. But, uh, no, it was, uh, he gave this talk and he did the number of release titles was something like, you know, 492, whatever, for the original 2600. And in the last 10 years, there have been like 100 releases, and, and by now it's probably 125 releases. Right. So, you know, when you think about it, in the 10 years since, you had all these games, comparatively a large number to the, the original launch. It's not like we've had five more yeah. and there are 500. We've had 100 and something more, you know, yeah. which is huge. And I love the fact, because, you know, I love the 2600 so much. I love the fact I can come here and buy a game that when I get home, I take it out of the box for the first time, I put it in my console, and I'm playing a brand new game yeah. for this coming up on 40-year-old console. <laughs> I mean, how cool is that, you know? Yeah. I love it. And, and that's why we were talking with David Crane, how there's a, often a wish amongst, you know, the players, the fans, that the original developers, the alumni, would do what we wish they would do. And there's complications to that, you know. I might not. It might be a great sell CGE. It might sell, you know, 200 carts, and you have 200 ecstatic people that you made what they wanted you to make. Right. But it might not be worth setting up a company, running a business, <laughs> paying your mortgage, and all these other little details. You're right, right so, about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he doesn't ask questions, does he? No, he just no, it just no, goes no. on like this. Yeah. Yeah. Leading into the question. I just keep, yeah. 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 Do, saying, do yeah. Long coming. If you sit with that long, you know. <laughs> I <laughs> promise <laughs> there is. Explain to what well, spotted it. Yeah, okay. I'll, we're explaining <laughs> to our listeners the importance if I miss of this, right? <laughs> you know how, how what a big deal this is. What was it that led you to just do it, where so yeah. many don't? You know. Right. Yeah. Um, that was it. That was That's the question. question. That was, that was question. it. Uh, <laughs> okay. Buried in all of that. Um, so I, uh, someone recommended uh, racing the beam to me. I went back in the day. I wrote games for the Atari 800. So I wrote uh, three games for a uh, kind of obscure company called Ramox when I was in um, high school and then going into college. In fact, mm -hmm. I had written this frog Frogger clone called Froggy, and right. they and it just said buy Eddie Freeze and I just gave it to some friends and it made its way around like software does yeah. and this company down in California saw it and they tracked it back to me up in Seattle they found the right Eddie Freeze in the country I was working at a pizza place and they just showed up <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. like we want you to make games for us it was okay. like you know yeah it's like a dream come true you drop know? a pizza on the ground <laughs> exactly, walk to I'm out of here were you really bad at making pizza <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I made some bad pizzas I remember somebody bringing me back a pizza and it's like I don't really want to complain but he, he shows me the pizza and it has a cigarette but baked oh. into oh. it you know, I have no oh. idea how that happened but <laughs> I was the chef so it's I didn't smoke. Yeah, I don't know no. where it came from. But, um, but anyway, yeah, yeah, you didn't want to eat at my pizza place. Um, definitely better programmer. Anyway, yeah. that's yeah. The, the, your question. So, so I hadn't worked on any of this stuff. I hadn't written 6502 assembly for 30 years. Um, and uh, somebody tells me about racing the beam, which is the the 2600. The 800 is quite a bit more powerful. You get 48k of memory. You've got um, 
Uh, Bitmap gra graphics? A, a, you, you've got much better graphics, yeah, exactly. Um, but I, I'm like, okay, great. So I read the book, and I was interested in uh, trying to just write a little code. I didn't think it would turn into anything, but mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, what am I going to do? And I, So I just brought out Microsoft Paint, and I said, I'll draw the Master Chief. And I'm, not, I'm a terrible artist, but if, right. if you're down to like eight pixels, yeah, almost yeah. anybody can be an artist. Right, right. right. Yeah. So I just drew the Master Chief, and, and first time I drew it, it's the way it looks in the game. So sometimes nice. stuff just works, mm -hmm. you know? So I drew it, and I was happy with it. I was like, oh, that looks like the Master Chief. And so I wrote a little code to bring it up on the screen. I could bring it up in Stella, the, the yeah. emulator yeah. debugger. Yeah. 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 Um, and then I was like, oh, well, I need an enemy. So I drew a little elite, which is also the one you see in the game, and then um, had them shooting. And then I was like, oh, I got to make them shoot. So I shot back and forth. And, and over the next couple months, I just added little bits to it. But it wasn't serious. It was just mm -hmm. playing the around. The sound was great. The shot. Sound didn't yeah. come till later. But yeah, I could talk more about sound. On the, but anyway, um, it was still just for fun, and then I went to GDC, so March time frame, mm -hmm. and there I happened to run into uh, Mike Micah and Chris Charla and a bunch of kind of old game industry mm -hmm. guys who are also yeah. collectors, mm -hmm. and I said, you know, I've been screwing around in this 2600 just for fun, and I told them what I was working on, they're like, Halo 2600, <laughs> like, you gotta do it, you know, you gotta do it, and Todd Fry was, just happened to be there, yeah, you know, yeah. um, and Todd Fry's like, and, I, why make it only 4K? I was like, I want it to be 4K. <laughs> yeah. I want the challenge. I wanted it yeah. to be a game you could have bought back in the day. Right, you know? right. Um, and uh, anyway, they really encouraged me to go forward and do it. And so th then so then it was March, and I looked at the calendar and I said, well, Classic Gaming Expo, I think that year was in July. I was like... Yeah, into July, 1st of August. It was at the bridge weekend. Yeah. Right, and I was like, okay, that's my goal. I'm going to try to finish it between now and then. <laughs> And um, it got busy. It was it got challenging to, to turn it from just a prototype into a real game in that time. But I got it done. So we're, we're it's familiar not perfect. With the There's challenge. a few bugs I could tell you, but we, I got it done. <laughs> well, you know, why don't you <laughs> tell us about the bugs? I, I've enjoyed the hell of it. It would be interested in knowing, you know, what's in there. You know, what, yeah. what, what's any Easter the, eggs? Sure. Well, the biggest Easter egg, which um, I've written about before, so a lot of people know mm -hmm. about, it, is something I call Magic Land. Okay, and. Um, I, I don't know why I call it that, but uh, well, it'll sort of be apparent. But mm -hmm. so the original version, uh, you had one life, and um, so it was a lot harder core than it is now. And anything you touched, you died. Okay. And uh, my my play testers, which was like Mike Micah and Chris Charla and, a yeah, bunch yeah. Of, and Ian Bogos, you know, they're whining that it's too hard, too hard. You know, like play testers <laughs> yeah, always yeah. do. And, and, if you're a developer, you're like, oh, you whiners. But, you know, so so um, I gave them three lives, fine. Um, and then, because um, programmers are lazy, that's the thing you got to know. So yeah. it's, not, it's not that they don't want to make it easier or whatever. They just don't want to change things because yeah. it's work to change mm -hmm. things. So. Oh, we had, um, um, uh, who was it? Uh, Steve Wieda sat in that chair not 30 minutes ago and explained to us exactly how lazy he was. Yeah. But it came to, you know. It, it's it, really important to be lazy as a programmer, I think, because... <laughs> It's the only way you could make something like that small. You know, if you were ambitious, it would end up being you know 16k or yeah, 100k right, yeah. or whatever. You would never get it to 4k. You got You got to be really lazy to do a small game. Our game is grabbing <laughs> every bite that the DPC Plus melody cartridge can provide. <laughs> exactly. See, you're not lazy enough. We're not programmers. <laughs> we found some. So um, you got too many programmers too. That's your other problem. You get more programmers, you just get more code. Um, anyway. So then they were whining that every time they hit something, they died. Well, that was because I was too lazy to do uh, hit testing. Because, you yeah. know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's like you, you know once you're on top of something, you know you hit it. But then what do you do? Yeah. Um, and so, like, like, do you bounce? Or if you, if you run Light into up. a wall, yeah. but bounce which way? It's actually kind of a tricky problem. Yeah. Um, so I was like, well, what does adventure do? So I, you know, was rooting through the adventure code. And they do something super simple. And just, duh. They just remember the last, where they were last time. So on the next frame, if they're colliding, yeah. they go back to the position where they were last mm -hmm. frame. Great. It does a little, yeah, I remember that. And yeah. that makes it do that little shake. Yeah, and you'll see that shake. in Halo. Right, you'll right. see that in adventure, uh, which isn't beautiful, but it works and you're lazy. And so it it's works. Fine. Great. Um, <laughs> So, but what I didn't realize was 
there, that created a bug where right at the very edge of, of the screen, if you push into where you make the collision, it actually both crosses onto the next screen and then it tries to flip you back to the last position, um, which actually t ends up putting you outside the map. The map is 64 rooms, okay? Um, but in 8 bits, you can represent numbers from 0 to 256. Well, so effectively, there's enough space for 256 rooms. Well, that's, that little trick catapults you out of the 64 rooms and into a space that I never intended to exist, okay? Mm -hmm. And so now the, the, the program is going through just grabbing random bytes of memory, but the program's trying to interpret them as, oh, it means a mon it needs this kind of monster and this kind of wall configuration. Mm -hmm. and so. It was like all of a sudden there were a whole bunch of rooms I didn't design with monsters I didn't design. That's why I called it Magic Land the first yeah. time I saw it. I was <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. I, I, I mean, I wrote this game and I'm sitting there playing through these rooms that I didn't create, I didn't know existed. Mm. And it was it was a really wow. fun experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I got to leave this bug in. Plus, lazy, right? Yeah. So it's easier to leave it in, to you know. But it especially yeah. it's like, okay, it's it has a cool effect and it's hard to get, so that's fine. Um, so Magic Land is, is definitely the cool bug. There's there's some other, you know, just where I'm being lazy, like uh, there's, you walk in a room where there's three, three, and three guys, yeah. and um, there's a bunch of things that are broken about that room. <laughs> I just I just wanted it to scare this people, like, whoa, finished, there's nine, you know? <laughs> but, um, but, you know, their bullets don't really work right, and when you kill one, all three in a row go away and stuff like well, that. Well, yeah, I mean, but, I figured, you know, the three in a row dying was... It didn't appear to me as a bug. It just appeared to be, you know, interesting feature. <laughs> you know? To me, that room was just a joke. It was just like, oh, so many monsters. You know? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, when but, I first oh, played, really I went. just three. They're just trying to scare me, you know. Um, I, I went in. I went back. I was like, oh, okay, what do I do? Go in, shoot, run back, you know. And it, it, it was a uh, let me get the hell out of here moment. You know, brilliantly done. I liked it. There's a few other more obscure bugs I'll probably skip, uh, but that can, that can happen to you. But they don't happen very often. Well, I think it's great. Like I said, I've had a great time with it. And, you know, at my uh, arcade party, like, we you know he was at one of my. Yeah. We I had Halo Twenty Six Hundred running in the arcade party. You know, at well, the, if you uh, haven't been to Magic Land, you have to go. It's a, I haven't been it, to Magic it's Land. It's a crazy experience because there's weird looking creatures there, and they and they sh they'll act weird. Like some will shoot three bullets, or they'll it's um, like random that, stuff. Yeah, it, random in a weird way. Yeah. Um, uh, and there's actually a way to like shortcut through Magic Land to get out to the end. There's there's videos on uh, YouTube that show a way People to go basically from the start room to the to the finish by just going through Magic Land. So now you uh, left that in there on all future versions, I guess. Well, there are yeah. There's no future versions. There's just the one. Well, right, well, I mean, I know there's the CG release version, and oh, the, the, it's just a has different labels. The right, other so one. the, the yeah. ROM stayed the same throughout. Yeah, okay. there is a PAL version that has some minor modifications just with color changes stuff like that but yeah it, it's basically the same yeah. so can you get back from magic land back onto the map you can yeah 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 by doing the same thing actually you just just end up walking through a, a room that where the math works out that you're back in the initial 64 right and then all of a sudden you just pop back into back. the the real <laughs> world again yeah so so before writing uh, atari games which obviously wasn't your real real job or anything like that you, <laughs> you worked on a couple other boxes something to do with a little something called uh with, Mi with microsoft game studio so i, how, I did yeah how did that all come well, before, about before games it was it was it uh, office before games or was it the other yeah, way around so i'll tell a little more yeah, of my yeah. career so yeah. You know, I worked for that little company, Ramox, 82, mm -hmm. 83, 84. That was, I graduated from high school in 82, went, went to college to get a computer science degree, 83, 84. So the entire video game business, as you guys know, but most yeah. people don't, melted down, 84. Uh, a lot of companies went out of business, including Ramox. Um, Ramox is an interesting company because they put out cartridges with EEPROMs in them. And um, the idea was, if you got bored of the game, you'd take it to a 7-Eleven and put it into this programming station and mm. erase the game that was on it and put a different game on it. Um, so that was the whole idea, that, uh, which was kind of ahead of its time, I think. Yeah. But, but anyway, they went out of business. Um, uh, I was getting my, I was getting my computer science degree, and um, I grew up in Bellevue, Washington, mm. which is next to Redmond, Washington, mm. um, and so. When I went back home for the summer, I'd look for a job. And I looked for a job one summer, and I interviewed a bunch of little software companies, got a job. But
But everywhere I interviewed, they said, why don't you interview at Microsoft? And I'm like, <laughs> that's like the company that makes mice. I mean, they, were, they didn't yeah. do much back then. There was like mice and yeah. DOS. Yeah. But, but the next summer, was summer 85, I'm like, okay, I'll send a resume to Microsoft. And they, um, they liked my resume. They flew me out there for an interview and uh, offered me a job. And I worked that summer as an intern. They liked the job. I, they, they gave me the nickname Fast Eddie because they thought I was a fast programmer. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, that, or it just sounded good. But so a fast lazy so, program. So I, exactly. Yeah. You, I, I'm lazy and fast go together oh, too. Yeah. By the fast way. Eddie's the name of a guitarist as well. It was also yeah. the name Multiple. of an Atari game. It I was because if you're gonna yeah, but I with a Y, but yeah, yeah that's right. for me. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so went back to college, graduated. They offered me a full time job to come back. And um, they put me on the first version of Excel for Windows. So there were seven programmers, and we did the first version of Excel for Windows, mm -hmm. which was a great team, great project mm -hmm. to work on. And so our job was to beat Lotus one, two, three. Lotus was bigger than all of Microsoft yeah, back then. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so we battled Despite Lotus. Despite being awful, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a lot of Lotus fans on DOS. Yeah. But yeah. Um, we we battled Lotus for five years, and our team grew up to about 50 people. And I I became the lead programmer by the end, the right. called the technical lead at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And then my boss went over to be the business manager at Word, and he immediately got in a fight with the development manager over there. The development manager quits, <laughs> and he's like, Ed, come over, you know, work on Word, so you can be a dev manager. So I, I went over, and all of a sudden I was managing a 60-person team. Right. And that's a whole other story, because mm -hmm. they were at war with each other, and it was yeah. like this big yeah. disaster. But yeah. anyway, I got them organized and focused, and we worked and I we did versions of Word for five years um, so I uh, and we're battling Word perfect and beating them um, um, so I'd been at the company for 10 years uh, and the next step up for me in my career was to run a business um, but I, I, at that point I was still programming part-time I was managing programmers and I could still program and so if I was going to step up and, and run a business I had to give up programming and it was like wow, there's only two things I really like to do you yeah. know programming and playing games you know because yeah. on the side I'm playing games all this time right. you know okay. yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, I was like what if I have to give up programming maybe I could still be involved with games or get back to being involved with games so I, I looked around the company and I found um, the ga game group at the company, which was only like 50 people. They were doing Flight Simulator and right, not yeah. too much else. Mm -hmm. And um, I said to my bosses, that's the job I want to take. I want to go run this game business. Um, and uh, they wanted me to go run PowerPoint. Like, <laughs> okay. So that was the choice, you know. Yeah. And they told me uh, I was crazy. They, they, uh, two vice presidents hauled me into their offices. They told me I was committing career suicide. They told me, why would you leave office, one of the most important parts of the company, to go work on something nobody cares about? Right. Yeah. Um, right. At the time, Microsoft was not a game powerhouse. Yeah. No. I remember, like, the, for Windows, there's, the, like, the Microsoft Game Pack and Microsoft Arcade. Yeah. And it was like, oh, a couple games there, but Microsoft's not a game company. Yeah, I don't care. That's right. And, and that was the market, That's yeah. That's right. Return of Arcade, that was one of our games from back then. So I ignored them, and I took the job anyway, and... Um, I had no business experience at all, so that was exciting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I had I had some credibility when the company they were willing to give me some rope or you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. But With um, which to hang yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Two weeks later, um, I'm in Japan. I had uh, flown with several people from the group and we spent all day meeting with Japanese game developers so met with Yu Suzuki and Naka and met with uh, got to see um, Resident Evil when it was under development yeah. I remember they showed me this game they're really proud of it yeah. uh, what they call biohazard there yeah. in Japan yeah. Yeah. and uh, it, it was early in development they showed me this thing and I'm like this is just alone in the dark yeah. you know? <laughs> and they're like yes yes alone in the dark you know? <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know it was clear what they what they had ripped off to make yeah. this yeah. this franchise. Um, but anyway, I'm walking down the street that night, and I just I just remember like this weight coming off my shoulders because all these people had told me I was making a mistake, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, but two weeks later, I'm in Tokyo, and I'm like, yeah, I have the best job in the world. Yeah, you know? this is I totally made the right decision, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I spent the next three or four years um, building up the games group and. Uh, the next year, we, uh, we had a deal with a little Texas company called Ensemble Studios. And so just before you move on to that, was that a completely different mentality from the, the organization structure you had in 
on the office side was it did you, did the people in that games division feel like they were the poor relations you know yeah. nobody cared about them they did yeah they kind of did but they didn't when you work in games you're sort of used to that <laughs> I mean right. you're used to because it's not a proper job yeah right I mean <laughs> it's not a proper job there's sort of a community of game developers that you be, that you become not, and I don't just mean programmers I mean people who work yeah. on games and it has its own community feel like if you go to a GDC right. everybody's very supportive even yeah. though they work at different companies yeah, it's a very small industry it, it always has been it, even to this day as large as it is it, it is a small it's industry very small and um, and so you kind of become part of that, and, you're, and you just sort of ignore that the outside world yeah, doesn't yeah. understand you very well, yeah, you know. Yeah. So where was I? Oh, Age of Empires. So yeah. uh, Ensemble Studios, so the next year we launched Age of Empires, and it was a big hit for us. We already had, Flight Simulator was already profitable, mm -hmm. so I had profit from that, profit from Age of Empires coming in. And, and what people had said was true. Nobody cared about what I was doing, which was great. <laughs> you know, I, le I learned that that was actually a great thing because um, as long as I was making a little money for the company, nobody cared. So yeah. I just took all the money and reinvested it going out and just, what would you do if you were in charge of something like that? Wouldn't you go like work with all your heroes? So, you know, yeah. went down, oh, yeah. I did a Absolutely. deal with Chris Roberts to start a company called Digital Anvil. Did a deal with Jordan Weissman, ended up buying uh, FASA and moving them out. The guys who did Mech Warrior. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, made multiple acquisitions. So and, what, what, what affiliations did you have with Mech Warrior? So, um, so we bought the IP. Um, at, and, at which and, stage? I mean, do you remember it was one, two, three? It, uh, it was after Mech 2. So Mech 2 came out from Activision, and then and then we we had it from then on. So you, we did Mech three. Assault for Xbox, for example. And but yeah. I haven't told you about Xbox yeah. yet. But yeah. um, so but you, we you, but you we were, did Mech War we did another version of Mech Warrior and an expansion pack. I don't remember all of them. Oh yeah, but. there's a uh, the uh, Clan Gray Bear, Clan Ghost Wolf. Jade Falcon. Oh. Yeah, I wish I remembered, honestly. I, no, I bought I, them all. I made more than 100 games back in those days. It was <laughs> kind of crazy times. That was the era when I was a PC gamer because yeah. Mech Warrior for me was always a favorite series. And here it was, you know, I'd read all the books, you know, we played the role playing games. And I played a couple of Mech games, but it was always like a little 2D overhead graphic or whatever. Yeah. And here it was, you're in the ca canopy of the Mech. Yeah. And the dropship comes down, and you see all your, you know, your your HUD booting up and all that, and yeah. you hear the radio sounding, and then the the legs bounce, and then you're walking. And three was just the intro scenes alone, right? Where I had the camera fly in, and yeah. the narrator would say, "Jade Falcon has stood alone for 200 years in the game." <laughs> you remember this well? That's oh, good. I played you remember that. better than I do. <laughs> Hell out of it. I remember better. Better, I remember Crimson Skies, the first version of Crimson Skies that we did, which was also that same team, the Fossa team. And then we did a Crimson Skies for Xbox, of course, uh, 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 later. So anyway, um, do, was doing PC games, had grown the group up to maybe 500 people by that point, and, uh, and was starting to look at how we could grow the business even, even further. And uh, console looked interesting to me. And right about that same time, uh, these crazy guys walked into my office. They were from the DirectX team. And um, they had this idea to make something they called the DirectX box. So um, it was going to be a Windows PC, but in a, in a box. It was going to sort of act, from the customer point of view, it would look like a game console. But yeah. really, it would just be a Windows PC in disguise yeah. running DirectX. DirectX is the Windows API for games. Right. Yeah. I, I say yeah. that more for your audience than yeah. you guys. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, so anyway, so the DirectX box. And, um, and to me, that sounded like a really good thing because um, well, we were PC developers, and, and so how do I get in the console business? It's a different kind of style, a different mentality. Yeah. At that time, the games were very Japanese, because Japan really dominated the business. And so I thought, wow, this is great, yeah. Um, and so they wanted, they needed my support, because I made all the games from the company. And so I agreed to help them, and then we got some other uh, kind of bigwigs at the company to help and ultimately got the project approved, which I could tell you more about. And then, um, you know, the rest was craziness. So, um, you know, so we, I, we I, you should probably ask questions. About we have debates on our show about what is retro. And, and, how, and the retro I, please the tend to show Xbox up. Out? Awesome. How many years ago was that now? It launched in November 2001, so it's 11 years. Yeah, now. 11 years, so yeah. we don't know if that's retro or not. We're retro gaming around it. But, <laughs> but I tell you what, I mean, the PlayStation, the Xbox, 
PS2. I mean, it's almost like those are they will not they will be yet, retro. But, but yeah, they're, 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 <laughs> we, they're getting close, I think. Well, there will be a point when that <laughs> arrives, and they, and they will be retro. You know, I have a rule, and it, it's it's a rule I, I occasionally break, but I tend to say. If I bought it for my kid, it isn't retro. <laughs> and um, it may be an awesome thing. There's stuff I bought for him. I bought him, you know, an Ace Fraley signed Les Paul. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's an awesome thing, but it's only 10 years old, you know. Right. So awesomeness doesn't mean it's classic yet. I mean, there are cars made today they are going to be amazing classics. So, and he has a different definition. He has a different definition. And every one of our listeners has a different definition. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, we got a bit on our show whenever we start debating this. He hits the soundboard. You hear the retro police come out. You know? Oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, well, nobody so, likes to think of themselves as being retro. You know, that's the problem. No, <laughs> no classic, but not retro. Classic, but not retro. But, <laughs> no, so... Um, so yeah, we launched in November 2011, uh, or 2001, I mean, uh, in the U.S. We launched in um, Japan in February 2001, and my first son was born in March 2001. So, and his name is Xander, X-A-N-D-E-R. He's named after the Xbox, so, oh, wow. he's, so nice. he is retro. You know? Very cool. <laughs> so, uh, all right, it's not strictly retro, but I want to go into the Xbox a little bit so yeah. uh, just a few of the decisions that were made about it yeah. um, you needed a, an add-on device to have DVD playback and you said yourself you're a PC yeah. company making yeah. PCs yeah. that play DVDs back yeah why did the Xbox now yeah um, you know I was more the, on the doing this games than those kinds of decisions but I was in a bunch of those meetings it, it all had to do with royalties and that there was royalties that you had to pay for DVD playback to, and they didn't the DVD decoding yeah right. so they didn't want to build that royalty price into every box and right. so the whole idea of selling you that little IR thing that plugged in yeah. and the yeah. was, right, right. was just to have a way to, to pay the money for the royalties I don't know if it's patents or royalties or whatever for mm -hmm. for the decoding so that's what that the similar about. things uh, I believe with mp3 and the Wii uh, may very I well be. I, I, don't I, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> but but that's the answer to that question. I remember that. Yeah. Now, um, when did the uh, concept of uh, I mean, the Xbox came at it, the beginning of an era where online consoles had been attempted, i.e., the Dreamcast. You know, yeah. with its dial-up, then its network. You know, um, what stage in the game did you say we're going to have network, but not just network capability. We're going to have our own massive. You know live connection system yeah, yeah. but you've uh, at all well, well, there, the, well there, were, there were a couple important things about that um, and I can't take credit for those <laughs> I can take credit for fighting for the fighting for the hard disk uh, that I really wanted it to have which yeah. was the first console with a hard disk whether yeah. that was smart or not I don't know but I'll take well, the, I'll take the credit minute, or the yeah. blame yeah. I was smart <laughs> twice but go ahead <laughs> yeah. so the first thing was uh, the decision about whether to put a modem in it which today just sounds ridiculous. Yeah. But, oh, yeah. Yeah. but back yeah. at that mm. time, dial -up it was not dead. It, dial up mm. was a huge part, actually. Mm. Most mm. people had dial up, not, not broadband in their mm -hmm. home. And that was a decision that my boss, Robbie Bach, made. He, um, you know, there was, a lot, there was a lot of debate about we've got to have a modem, there's cost associated with a modem. Cost drives a lot of decisions in these yeah. consoles. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he just one day came in and said, nope. We're just going to bet on the future. We're going to go broadband. So that was a really important first part yeah. of, mm -hmm. of supporting Xbox Live. Um, the actual system was designed by um, a team under a guy named Jay Allard. So uh, if you think about, of me as doing um, the games for Xbox, Jay was the guy who did the system software for Xbox. And there was a guy, Todd Holmdahl, who did the hardware for Xbox. What, so, what, did, what was uh, Seamus? What was his role in <laughs> Seamus, this? Seamus was like an evangelist. Yeah. That's what Seamus is. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to get me in trouble. He's going to listen to me. Because, <laughs> yeah, we go way back, so yeah. I, can, I can give him a hard time. In yeah. fact, mm -hmm. he, he called me when I launched Halo 2600, and he was... He was like, what? You worked on, the, I didn't know you were writing a 2600. Yeah. I, I, where's my copy? You know, <laughs> did you know I've also written 2600 games and stuff? So yeah, I see him and, he and Van at the, the arcade auctions all the time. Oh yeah, they're there. hardcore. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, Supercade yeah. And, and Innovative Leisure, the yeah, new company. Yeah, yeah. Um, Seamus was one of the key guys who came up with the initial concept for the Xbox. So I didn't mean to reduce his role right. to evangelist. <laughs> yeah. um, he, was, he was one of those crazy DirectX people who walked into my office and said, this is something we want to do. And so he really helped 
evangelize the idea both within the company and then later outside the company. And that that was the biggest yeah. thing that he did. But but he's a super smart guy. I mean, yeah, he's yeah. you know physicist, programmer. I remember I was in a meeting with him, and he I look over and he's sitting there doodling in hieroglyphics, which is an interest of mine too. So I, I lean over during the meeting and I, I write the the translation under it of what, of what, of what, of what he's like. <laughs> he looks at me, you know, it's like, no. so, I know. It's like, <laughs> so it's, you know, it's just like nerds one upping each other. But, yeah, you yeah, know, so. yeah. So uh, Scott mentioned the hard drive then. Yeah. Um, you I fought find for it. Um, Assuming somebody fought against it, yeah. Was there any discussion before it went in about look, people are going to try and hack this console, and it's going to be used for things that we wouldn't necessarily approve of? And was that the argument around the hard drive? Was it cost? Yeah, the argument around the hard drive was almost almost exclusively cost. But what a lo what a lot of people don't know is there were there were two competing console efforts actually inside the company. Right. So there was a group that had done. Um, Windows CE for Dreamcast, if you remember oh, right, that. You right, guys probably yeah, do. Yeah, Not, yeah. A lot of people have forgotten oh, that. I did. Mm -hmm. And that group was a, a group of ex uh, 3DO people who had come into nice. the company through an acquisition. And they, at the exact same time, they wanted to uh, launch a console. And so um, you had the Xbox team and you had these guys. And both teams built their, their sort of dream team of guys. They, Xbox had me on their side, which yeah. gave them some credibility because yeah. I was the one who made games. But, mm -hmm. um, but uh, both of us had our vice presidents, and it went all the way up to Bill, and he got to pick between these two um, right. teams. Right. And and he went with us. I think, I mean, I, who knows why Bill does what he, he does? does. He's a smart guy, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But but we th we think we won because we were basically saying this is a Windows machine. Uh, um, <laughs> and their machine was very much like a PlayStation. Yeah. Okay, but we knew nothing back then. When we made the initial pitch, we, these guys understood console way better than we did. And, and that's what we learned as we were like, okay, we got the job. Yeah. And then the more we looked into it, we were like, oh, we can't really run Windows. That would be a bad idea. Yeah. And we can't. Yeah. And we, got, we started taking more and more of their ideas, even though their thing was canceled. Right. Right. And so where we ended up was really somewhere in between the two projects. And you, and you might argue the 360 is even closer to what they, to what they had. To what they had. So yeah. they may have been right all along, but you know, there's something you, about politics in the big company and what it takes here. to get, yeah. get something approved, right? So the hard disk was always kind of key to that pitch about why Xbox was different. You know, what was, I mean, Microsoft wasn't really known for games, certainly in the console business, right? And so part of our argument was we need to do some things that are different than what the competitors are doing. Um, and hard disk was one key difference. Um, and, and it did make things like Xbox Live uh, more interesting when you yeah. can download. The hacking thing, we always knew there would be hacking and, um, and we did some, the hardware and, and system software guys did some things that to try to discourage to it a, it a bit, bit, make difficult. it a little harder, but they, they knew yeah. they were only making it a little They'll bit always get there in the Well, the yeah. one thing that they in, were in very... In fact, there were some scary kind of Eastern European hackers at the, right. at the company that right. uh, I didn't know existed until then, and they at, at one point gave one to them and said, "Try and to break it." To try and, and and it. and they broke it in I don't know afternoon. Yeah, Same, right. yeah. Right. I mean, <laughs> they, well, I they had one, no problem. One thing yeah. that I think uh, Microsoft yeah. did very intelligently was the ability to detect a mod chip and then boot you from the live because they understand I think that there is going to be a segment that will mod the console, but let's not let him cheat and ruin the, you know, Yeah, Live the gave, gave us a yeah. new way to, to enforce that, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. And, but uh, the things that I think are the most brilliant, though, the thing about... Is, though, I, one thing I would just say on that is, it's not like... I mean, I, I wouldn't have been able to say this when I worked at Microsoft, but nobody ever really cared about, like, the retro community yeah. doing, no. you know, modding mm -hmm. all this mm -hmm. stuff. You have to do enough copy protection so that you protect the ecosystem for your partners. You know, so that right. when you're working with Square, or EA, right. or whoever, yeah. right. you have you can credibly say we're we're making an effort to stop your stuff from being copied and yeah. our own, our first party yeah. stuff. Yeah. But it's not you're not really losing a sale to some retro guy who runs Mame on his no, Xbox right. or whatever. You know? right. so. Like me, I I, um, I bought my son an Xbox and I gave him. Uh, you know, a bunch of games here and there, and you know, he enjoyed it. I never, I don't think I ever really played the thing. It's just, I was in my arcade mainly. I mean, I've always been an arcade and pinball collector, so I was much more interested in collecting, restoring arcade and pinball than I was an Xbox console. Yeah. 
then I was actually at CGE <clears throat> uh, 2010, and uh, Jay Golden and his crew had a Xbox set up with uh, Steel Battalion. Yeah. And you remember that over yeah, in the corner? Absolutely, yeah. the big. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've I walked over, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, "What the fuck is that?" And so I go over there. I'm like. When is this coming out? Because I thought it was like some super sneak preview or something. Right. I had no idea. That was what, at all. Ten, seven or eight years ago, I think. Yeah. Well, I just, it wasn't on my radar, right? Yeah, that's a long time. And ago. I had no idea. And, and you know, in the thing in the aviation world, simulators don't need to be super high fidelity graphics. Yeah. They need to have transfer training. They need to be good enough to do the job, but nothing beyond that. And this was a simulator for something that doesn't exist yet. Yeah. So I would, I could not believe that <laughs> that. I, and he goes, "Oh, it's just an Xbox." And he had his. Well, with, it's you like know, what Jordan did. Jordan Weissman did in the BattleTech centers. You know, he did these yeah. these built-in. Uh, they were like arcades where you went in and got into right. these pods, the pods and drove and the, the battle pods. Yeah. And, and that was like that on my desktop. Yeah. So exactly. you know, I, he told me all about it. And he showed me the you know the solid state modded Xbox and all that. I was like, oh, I'm in. So I was at the uh, at McCarran here, you know, on eBay on my phone, hunting down a uh, you know steel battalion set, which I found like a couple miles from my house. Put a bid on, got on the plane, got off the plane. Oh, did I want I want a bid, you know? Yay. And then uh, went to a couple places and I found an Xbox in the box. It was still sealed, you know. Nice. I was like, ooh, tear it open, unbox it, go plug it up, you know. And then the ability to throw in the mod chip and stick in the hard drive so that I could just copy the disks in and have a faster loading time and yeah. all that. And no, you guys didn't lose a sale over that, you know? Yeah. And when the decision came to buy, you know, a 360, it's like, oh well, yeah, I mean, you know, the, that's pretty cool, you know? And so, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't hurt sales on an individual basis, you know? Us running MAME isn't gonna keep us from going out and buying Steel yeah. Battalion oh, Certainly partner, not in the collector you know? market, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my See, Xbox story was, I got in with, with the original Halo, of course, and it just, was never a big first-person shooter fan or anything up until then. I mean, other you know, Doom and stuff like that. Well, Doom and, was a nice little game. Oh yeah, yeah. But God, Halo just floored me, man. It just <laughs> floored me. I mean, I, I could still play today and then just have a freaking blast with it. Um, how important? I mean, it was, it was, uh, how important was that title at that time? And and speak some about exclusives because yeah. I, you know, I mean, I guess there's always been exclusives in, in one in one form or another. But uh, how how you know like. Bungie. I mean, w w was there ever a chance B uh, Halo would have shown up, you know, on with Sony? I mean, how did? Right. You know, so okay. Um, so the Bungie story. Um, I knew a guy who worked at Bungie. He was their kind of biz dev guy. His name was Peter Tampty. And uh, after Xbox got its final approval, which was in March of 2010, uh, I had less than two years to put together the full uh, launch lineup of uh, first party titles for it, which are all exclusive by yeah, definition, right. first yeah, party. Yeah. And um, and so I was really happy one day my phone rang, it was like Peter Tampty on the phone. Uh, I had played a bunch of Bungie's old stuff, so mm -hmm. I, I knew them pretty well. And and he said, you know, we're having trouble financially and uh, one company has offered to buy us, but we thought we should probably talk to a couple other people before we sell. Um, and we're, we just started this new thing, Halo. They had just showed at Macworld that, that initial video that you may have seen that looked quite a bit different than the final. Mm -hmm. But yeah. um, so uh, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely interested. And um, had some of my guys go check it out. And then we met at, at E3 that year. And um, I may be off by a year. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I think I'm off by a year. But anyway, um, I should get my dates right. But. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, um, we met and um, ended up putting the deal together. And uh, some interesting things about that deal, uh, Take-Two already owned a third of Bungie. Take-Two had, had published some of their stuff and yeah. then made a minority investment. So it had to be a three-way deal between us and Take-Two um, and the Bungie guys. And so uh, I only bought the team and the Halo IP. Um, they, the, part of the team was down in California at that time. The rest was in Chicago. I moved the Chicago guys out. The guys in California finished a game called Oni uh, for Take Two, and Take Two got all the back rights, all the old mm -hmm. titles. So all I got was all the guys in Halo. So I got right. the best part of the deal. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> um, as it turns out, but um, you know, and so then once they finished Oni, the rest of the guys moved up uh, to Redmond and went to work on on Halo. And 
and it was a hard job. And um, and there was a lot of skepticism around Halo when we when we showed it publicly. Internally, we were having a lot of fun playing it, and we thought this is pretty good. But we had other things we were doing. You know, we're new to the console business, yeah. and we did, we knew we didn't really know what we were doing. Mm -hmm. But in a way, that makes you second guess yourself, right? Because we're PC guys, and we get PC gaming and multiplayer. We think that's mm -hmm. important, but a console that didn't really exist. Uh, a guy in my group did a color palette analysis of Halo, which is not something we normally do, but he's like, this is console colors and this is the colors they're using in Halo. They're all wrong, you know, they're all PC colors. Yeah, know? yeah. I'm like, all right, we're not gonna show that to the Bungie guys. <laughs> you know, but, but um, you know, even the E3 before we launched, so E3 uh, 2001, uh, we were still running on half-speed hardware, mm -hmm. and uh, and we demoed it, and we got a really lukewarm uh, response from the press. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, oh, you know, this just looks like a PC shooter trying to be a console. And this mic right. it kind of shows Microsoft doesn't really understand the console yeah. business. Where's the big, cute, colorful character, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was a lot, there was a lot of that because there was skepticism yeah. just to begin with. My, who's Microsoft going into this business? Yeah. So um, it really wasn't until launch that, that Halo made its mark. And once it got to customers and customers... Yeah said this is something we want that the press kind of backed up and said oh yeah actually this is pretty cool yeah yeah uh, but 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 really we had other things like Lauren Landing's Odd World but it was much more traditional yeah. console that we mm -hmm. thought would be as important if not more um, so you never know in the game business till you launch something that's and right, see that's what right. happens so I gotta ask what, you, what do you think about the game industry today and and the goods the bads and I know we only have 10 minutes yeah sorry or so, I, I, so. I'll yeah, but and I, I, and I like did promise someone that. And I what are you kind of doing now, yep. and how did you get out of? Okay, what am I doing now? Oh, that's yeah, a whole that's bunch of stuff. Okay, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, <laughs> and then, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. I left Microsoft in 2004. Yeah. Uh, we were kind of, uh, we were d after Xbox launched, um, I took on additional responsibility. So I was doing third party as well as first party. So I was doing deals with the squares and EAs mm -hmm. of the world and stuff like that. Um, and we were planning 360 and um, and frankly probably the easiest way for me to explain it would be when I told you before that nobody cared what I was doing mm -hmm. yeah uh, by the time Xbox was out everyone cared what I was doing right I mean honestly yeah. it felt like being back on office because okay. where it's <laughs> all of a sudden really important to the company I mean it, which is understandable you're spending billions of dollars mm -hmm. um, but I really liked the freedom I had to run that group by myself and yeah you know, later later when people are all coming in and saying, well, why are you doing this or what about that? It's like, you know, no I've been doing anymore. this for like 10 years. Yeah. You know, I think I know what I'm doing by mm -hmm. now. Um, so, and, and you know, I, I didn't need to be at the company anymore financially. I was, I had one kid and I had a second one on the way. I was turning 40, all that stuff mm -hmm. was like, I, so it all just kind of culminated in me saying, it's yeah. time to leave. So yeah. mm -hmm. I left Microsoft in 2004, and, and my goal ever since has been to not have a real job. Yeah. Right. And, um, How's that I, holding out? I, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm both good and bad at it. I, so what I do today, I'm on six boards. So I'm on three game company boards, mm -hmm. and I'm on um, three not-for-profit kinds of boards. Yeah. So a science center, the IGDA, which is why I'm here this yeah. weekend, which is the International Game mm -hmm. Developers Association, and, a, and an Egypt group. Uh, and then um, I'm one of the owners of a game company called Airtight Games. Um, so Kim Swift works there, just released a game called Quantum Conundrum. Mm -hmm. uh, I run a 3D printing company called Figure Prints. We do right. uh, 3D color prints of World of Warcraft characters and Minecraft and, and Xbox Live That's avatars. your business. That's my business. Oh, yeah, I, because, I, I, yeah. I started and ran, and run that business. A lot of us are big 3D printer fans here. I am. Uh, <clears throat> Pat, who runs the arcade here, oh, okay. built his 3D printer from a kit that is built by a 3D printer. Oh yeah, and like a rep wrap or something. Yeah, yeah. that is it's a rep wrap. Yeah. I just yeah. can't remember the name. Sure. What? <laughs> brief answer. A number. How many years till you think it's a commercial product that you plug in and makes amazing things? <laughs> I'm saying five. It's it's and really. Is it going to be you that does it's, it? It's really <laughs> accelerating. There's it, it, it is accelerating. The 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 product I'm waiting for is a color plastic printer, uh, which I think could be pretty revolutionary. And I think we're going to have that in two years. Uh, less than two years, uh, so that I, I'll say that the other question is hard to answer. Um, I always say it's easy to tell the future; it's hard to tell when. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they did. We just had a 50-year anniversary. Sorry to go off on a tangent. No, no, no. It's no, your this fault. Is, this we we just had a 50-year anniversary of of this of the Seattle Center, which is where the World Fair was in 1962. Yeah. 
and they had they interviewed some kids back in 62 and they had them say what would the world be like 50 years in the future yeah. and one kid said oh we'll all have flying cars and mm -hmm. another kid said we'll all have rocket ships personal rocket ships mm -hmm. and then this crazy girl said uh, we'll all have a telephone in our pocket you know uh -huh. just like just totally nutty you know yeah. so but of course she's the only one who was yeah. right yeah so and then back then it was as crazy as any of the other ideas right so yeah. it's it's hard to tell when things are gonna happen for sure. is my answer um, so anyway I'm also an advisor to probably 20 or so game related technology companies sure. so so I have no full-time job so but you got I, rid of the job and now you're doing even more <laughs> I did. It sounds like it. and in my spare time <laughs> I do crazy shit like I yeah. write Halo Crisis yeah. so that's that's what I do um, and I, it's a good life, um, yeah. And I have two boys; they're seven and ten, and that's good. And so, Wonderful. yeah, everything's good. As far as the business now, it's a time of incredible change. Um, uh, it, it's almost like stepping backwards, where uh, big groups are breaking up into lots of little teams mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. A small mm -hmm. set of guys in a garage can do something Going again, which is, which is super exciting. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, and you know, you don't need a, a big publisher, and you don't have to put something in a box in the store. Yeah. You can you can write it and put it out there, and yeah. it'll be on an iPhone. It could be a big hit, you know. Yeah. So um, in that sense, it's a very exciting time. Uh, you know, friends I know who run big game console companies, it's it's, it's kind of a tough time because yeah. they're, the budgets are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and they're doing less and less games. Mm. And so, yeah. uh, and the games are getting, you know, they're all really well made, but a lot the franchises are old. I right. mean, you know, how yeah. long has Laura Croft yeah. been around? How long yeah. has Halo been around? How, mm. you know, mm. and so we can't just keep making, you know, the fourth, fifth, tenth yeah. sequel of things. So. That's yeah. my short answer to your question. Wonderful. Very good. Well, well, great. You're tight on time. So. Ed, yeah, thank you so much perfect. for coming thank by. Thank you so much. Yeah. We appreciate nice it. To you. Yeah. Viva!